thank you very much. Um, it is a historic place. Thank you very much for coming to this wonderful place. It is an amazing time in astronomy right now because of the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. So how many people watched the launch of James Webb on Christmas Day? Look at that, very impressive. Did it spoil your Christmas lunch? It nearly did mine because I was so nervous about all the things that I knew might go wrong uh, on that launch. But the good news is that James Webb's performance is actually better uh, than the specification. And its lifetime is going to be 15 years, not five years. So uh, we're going to have fantastic opportunities with uh, James Webb. Now, um, the... Uh, this deep image, which was first released uh, to the public in um, July of last year, is the first scientific image that was released at a press conference hosted by Joe Biden. And what you see is an eight-hour exposure with this fantastic new telescope. Uh, there is a bright star here in the center of the field, uh, but that's not really of interest. What is of interest is all of these white objects, which are galaxies that are physically at the same distance. We call that a cluster of galaxies. They're gravitationally bound to one another. And even that's not the most exciting thing in this image. What's really exciting are the objects that are red and distorted and magnified by this cluster of galaxies. This is a phenomenon that was predicted by Einstein over 100 years ago. It's called gravitational lensing. It's similar but not identical to optical lensing in the sense that this is a huge, this cluster of galaxies is like a huge telephoto lens in space. And James Webb is peering through it and using that as an additional telescope, a sort of free telescope, if you like, to look at the distant universe. These objects in red are much further away than the cluster of galaxies in the foreground here. Now, Joe Biden introduced this image. I think it's fair to say he didn't completely grasp the physics <laughs> of what was going on in this image, but you know he had many other things on his mind at the time. When we look out in space with a powerful telescope, we look back in time. Astronomers are time travelers. You're familiar with you know, the layers of rock in the Grand Canyon, and you know that as you go further down, you're going back in history. It's a very similar concept when we look out in space. The further we look, the further back we're looking back in time, because the speed of light is finite. The sun is eight light minutes away. If the sun were to mysteriously disappear, we wouldn't know for just over eight minutes. That's the light travel time from the sun to the earth. The nearest star is just over four light years away. But the situation is completely transformed when we use a powerful telescope like Hubble or the telescopes that I use on the ground. We're looking back not millions of years, not even a billion years, but over 13 billion years. Now the universe itself is we think 13.8 billion years old. So that's about three times the age of the solar system. And we're looking back then over 13 billion years to when the universe was less, less than 10% of its present age. So the challenge and the excitement is to try to piece together the history of the universe via direct observations. And obviously to do that, we need to know how far back we're looking. You see, when we look at this picture, not all of these galaxies at the same, uh, are at the same distance. Some of them are very nearby, some of them are very far away. How do we know how far we're looking? And that's obviously very important as a timestamp for determining uh, the history of the universe. We don't live long enough to witness any galaxy evolve. So it's a statistical question. It's a little bit like if you didn't know the human lifetime and you were only on the Earth for a few minutes, you might piece together a human story from a baby that you saw to a teenager doing something terrible to you know, an adult being sensible and to an old age person like me walking down the street. So you'd piece together the lifetime of a human by looking statistically at the population. 
And that's what we have to do uh, with uh, galaxies. This is the only equation in the talk, and it is in fact the only equation in my book. Um, what we're looking at here is the way in which we can determine how far back we're looking. Now, you probably know that the universe is expanding. You probably heard of the Big Bang, and you probably think the Big Bang was some kind of big explosion, and, you know, matter was sent hurling into space. That's not the correct view. Galaxies are not projectiles expanding into pre-existing space. They are actually sitting on space that is itself expanding. This was the realization that Einstein and many others made in the 1920s, that the solutions of Einstein's equation permitted space itself to be stretching, not a static material. So here's a galaxy here, far away, and we're here. And this blue light ray is beginning its journey from that galaxy to a telescope on the Earth. And it's such a long distance, and it takes that light ray so long to reach us that during that time, space has stretched. And so by the time it reaches us, not only has space stretched, but the light ray itself has stretched from being a blue light ray to a red light ray. And if you've heard the word redshift, that's what redshift is. Now, that's physically somewhat different from, you know, the ambulance that goes past you and you hear its siren and you notice the change in frequency. You know, the frequency changes depending on in, in which sense, depending on whether the ambulance is coming towards you or away from you. That effect is physically happening in the universe too. Galaxies may have very small motions which can give them that so-called Doppler effect. But this effect of the expansion of the universe is quite different and happens on very large scales. So what we need to do is to measure this redshift. So how do we do that? Well, we have to study the galaxy, the light signal that we get from the galaxy, and find some characteristic property of it. For instance, the fingerprints of hydrogen or carbon or oxygen that's contained in the radiation that, uh, that the galaxy emits. And if we know in the laboratory what that radiation looks like at rest, then we can measure the shift and how far those fingerprints have been shifted. And that gives us the redshift. And it's a very fundamental quantity because it is, it is the factor by which the universe has expanded since the light left that object. So every time we measure that redshift, it tells us how much smaller the universe was when the light left that object. And we can convert that redshift into what we call a look back time. If the redshift is zero, the object is nearby and we're witnessing it more or less today, at least on cosmological timescales. If the redshift is high, then the universe has expanded a huge amount since the light left that galaxy. Therefore, we're looking at that object when the universe was very young. So astronomers like the word look back time because it is a very, very useful concept. It's a time stamp. And each galaxy in that original picture will have a different redshift. So the technology to measure this redshift is fundamental to the observational astronomer. So Hubble, which I'm sure you've heard of, Hubble Space Telescope, has now been in operation since 1990. It's still there. It's not at all eclipsed uh, by James Webb. It's still doing fantastic work. And the combination of ground-based telescopes, which have measured the, these redshifts and beautiful images from Hubble, have given us the first glimpse of how galaxies evolve. So broadly speaking, today, there are two types of galaxies. Uh, over here, you see what we call an elliptical galaxy. It's a ball of stars. Uh, the stars are all more or less the same color, uh, and it's a very simple structure. This kind of galaxy down here is very similar to the Milky Way. It's a spiral galaxy. It has a nucleus, and it has spiral arms uh, that are quite blue. If we go back 
to when the universe was only 5 billion years old. These are the kind of pictures that Hubble delivers. Uh, their redshifts, if you're interested, are listed up here. They're determined from ground-based telescopes. So these two objects here look pretty similar to that elliptical galaxy, suggesting that elliptical galaxies formed quite a long time ago. These galaxies resemble a spiral galaxy. They have a nucleus, but they don't, they're not quite as beautiful. They're not as elegant, which suggests that they're still, they're still in a sort of more primitive uh, form. These galaxies here are what we call irregular galaxies. They're not symmetric. There are irregular galaxies today, but it looks like when we go back in time, there are many, many more of them. Now let's go to when the universe was only one to two billion years old. And you can see things really change quite markedly. Uh, the galaxies are not symmetric. They have multiple components, as if they're still coalescing. Uh, and they're physically small as well. So what you see in this picture is very similar to that story I told you about the alien that comes and lands on the Earth for a few minutes. You see the evolution not of an individual galaxy, but you see a sort of overall population change from small, multi-component objects that are irregular to the gradual formation of the beautiful galaxies uh, that we see today. So this story so far has taken about 20 years of research with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and these redshifts measured uh, from giant ground-based telescopes in Hawaii and Chile and other places. But I want you now to contemplate going even further back in time to this concept of cosmic dawn. So obviously this is a, a schematic illustration. Time is running from left to right. Here's the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. Now, what happened in the Big Bang is it was dense and very, very hot. All of the material was broken into its constituent particles. There were no atoms, no molecules. It was a gas that physicists would say is completely ionized. And there was radiation because the gas was very, very hot. And uh, as the universe expanded, it cooled. And about 370,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature went down sufficient that the electron and the proton combined to form the hydrogen atom for the first time. So we have this period which is, uh, is dark, uh, where there are hydrogen gas clouds in space. And this is sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages. Now, astronomers are very f fond of the adjective dark. You've probably heard of dark matter. You may have heard of dark energy. We now have dark ages. It's very useful to have these mysterious terms. It's very good for raising grants money, you know, to continue doing the research. So these gas clouds of hydrogen collapse under their gravity. They have mass, so they collapse eventually under gravity. And as they collapse, they get hot. Just like when you pump a bicycle tire and you compress the gas, uh, the bicycle tire heats up. The temperature goes up and up, and eventually nuclear ignition is ignited. And that's, of course, that fusion, hydrogen to helium, is how the sun is shining. And so the universe is, for the first time, bathed in starlight. And that moment, we rather euphemistically call cosmic dawn, the, the time when the universe is first bathed in starlight. We don't know if it's a dramatic event, you know, suddenly it was dark and then it was light, or whether it's a process that takes tens of millions of years. And the excitement and the story in my book is that we've reached the point where we hope to witness this event directly. Now, why, why is this important? Well, you know, the fusion that occurs in stars, hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, silicon, iron, is responsible for all the chemistry uh, that we see around us today. The universe at the, big, at the time of the Big Bang was primarily only hydrogen and helium. 
after 370,000 years. So everything that you see around us, everything in this room, everything in your body, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones was synthesized in stars. So this moment when starlight first emerged is in a sense the birth of everything that we see. It's a, a milestone just as important as the Big Bang itself. So um, I have a movie here, which I have to physically start. Um, it's a regrettable fact that we live in a world with theoretical astronomers. Uh, they have no need for telescopes or observations. They're, all they need is a powerful computer. And um, here's a simulation of Cosmic Dawn by one of my theoretical colleagues, Harley Katz, who's a, uh, at uh, Oxford University. And what you see here, Time is running. This is real time in millions of years since the Big Bang. And what you see is purple filamentary clouds of hydrogen collapsing and forming stars whose lives are so short, tens of millions of years, that they explode as supernovae. And all the nuclear products that have been synthesized in those stars are then pollutants that go back into space and then form the next generation of stars. It's a little bit like college soup. You know, it's basically refreshing the intergalactic gas and the interstellar gas in galaxies uh, and leading up to the chemi chemistry that we see today. So um, I like this figure very much because it sort of m mirrors my, my, uh, my own personal career. I was an undergraduate also in UCL in the 1960s. And what this is, is the most distant object. It's redshift and the age of the universe when it is being observed as a function of publication date. And uh, what you see is that when I was a student, the most distant galaxy was way down here with a redshift less than one being seen a few billion years ago. But then somehow through technology, We've looked so far back in time uh, that we're now measuring objects at redshifts of 11 when the universe was a mere 500 million years. That's something like 6 or 7% of its present age. And I use this slide a lot. It was produced by one of my colleagues at Imperial College. Um, but in the space of just a few months with James Webb, this figure is out of date. That's the progress that we make uh, through new technology and new facilities. So the big questions that we face today and the theme of the talk is, you know, when did this thing happen? When did this cosmic dawn occur? Was it gradual? Was it, uh, was it sudden? Uh, and most importantly, can we witness this event directly? Can we, will we wake up one day with uh, news from James Webb that we have found an object emerging from darkness so that we know exactly uh, when this whole story of all the chemistry in the universe and our presence in it uh, began. So um, back to uh, when I was a boy in Wales, North Wales, um, I went into the library and picked up this book uh, written by Patrick Moore. How many people remember Patrick Moore's programs? Yeah, you see, you're all enthusiasts. And um, this book, which I read when I was six, is about a boy and a girl who go to visit their eccentric uncle, uh, called Richard by chance. Um, and uh, he basically has a telescope and he introduces these children to the delights of the night sky. And, you know, I was inspired by this book. I realized that there's a universe up there, you know, that you look up and there's things to discover there. And from that point on, I was hooked. And uh, years later, I appeared on his program. You'll remember that Sky at Night is, was the longest running program. It was still running, of course, but it was the longest running program with the same presenter in world history. And uh, here's Patrick. And I told him about this book, and he gave me, when I got home a few days later, I got a copy uh, signed by him of his, what it seemed to be his personal copy. So um, it's an adventure 
exploring this universe, that curve I showed you about progressively going to more distant objects is an adventure that begins with a, with a mighty Palomar telescope uh, in California, which was first commissioned in 1948 and is still doing great work. Uh, it travels to Australia where then Prince Charles opened the Anglo-Australian telescope, a collaboration between the UK and Australia, uh, which meant astronomers like me had to go all the way to Australia several times a year just to use a big telescope. Uh, the UK then uh, exploited the wonderful skies in the Canary Islands and built the William Herschel telescope, uh, which is still uh, doing well. And then I emigrated to the United States and used the twin Keck telescopes on the summit of Hawaii before returning to Europe and using the European Southern Observatory's uh, large, very large telescope. Now, of course, those were ground-based telescopes. All of those telescopes are very powerful and contribute to the story, but there are space telescopes too. Everybody's heard of Hubble. It's still going. It has a mirror two and a half meters across. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which finished its um, campaign a few years ago, is uh, or was a uh, smaller telescope, but very powerful because it was working in the infrared. And now we have uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which has a mirror 6.5 meters across, so is considerably more powerful. I should emphasize that the power of a telescope is governed by the area of the primary mirror, which is the light collection that focuses the light from distant objects uh, onto the various instruments. So generally speaking, the power of the telescope goes as a square uh, of the diameter of the telescope. So um, the 200 inch, if you've ever visited it, and if you are ever contemplating a trip to California, it's well worth a visit, was the brainchild of this guy, George Ellery Hale. Um, sadly, he died before the telescope was finished, but he single-handedly raised private money for all of the world's largest telescopes, three of them in succession, a 60-inch, a 100-inch on Mount Wilson, and the 200-inch on uh, Mount Palomar. When I was... Uh, uh, eight years old, my sister and I had an had a, um, encyclopedia, and in the encyclopedia was this cutout uh, of an observatory. And it didn't just say which observatory it is, but it's obviously uh, the Mount Palomar telescope. And so it was amazing uh, to, uh, to look at this cutout picture. And my, I kept turning the pages back to it time and time again. So Hale. I arguably, Hale was the first person who really got inspired by this idea of looking back in time. He hired, firstly, he hired Edwin Hubble, whose name graces the Space Telescope. He also hired this man, Harlow Shapley, who used the largest telescope at the time that, that uh, Hale had raised the money for um, to measure the distance to this star cluster, Messier 13, what we call a globular cluster just outside the Milky Way. And he realized that this star cluster was something like 36,000 light years away. And therefore, we had the capability to see that cluster of stars, you know, before civilization really developed on Earth. And uh, this inspired him to create more powerful telescopes and to raise money from wealthy people like An Andrew Carnegie uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation. In 1928, Hale raised $6 million for the 200-inch telescope on Palomar. Um, it was the largest scientific donation, donation to any scientific endeavor uh, in history at that time. And this sentence was used in his, um, in his proposal to the Rockefeller Foundation. You know, I, I love it. Like buried treasures, the outposts of the universe have beckoned to the adventurous from immor immemorial times. So uh, Edwin Hubble appears on the scene. He was, um, this is an interesting man. He basically came to Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and studied law. 
Uh, but then he went back and decided he wanted to be an astronomer. He left Oxford back to California with an affected English accent, which really offended his uh, American colleagues. Um, but sadly, although he was waiting for the 200-inch, he died from a heart attack just a few years after the 200-inch uh, was, uh, was ready for action. And so he handed uh, the baton to his disciple, Alan Sandage. And Alan Sandage had a competitor, uh, this man here, who's still alive, Jim Gunn. And the two of them, you know, fought over telescope time on the 200-inch to look further and further back. Now, you probably think astronomers are, you know, surely they're just, you know, simple people. They, you know, they go to the mountain, they look through the eyepiece. They're very pleasant, easygoing people that, you know, spend their nights alone and everything. You can't imagine that they could be competitive and, you know, cutthroat and, you know, trying to prevent each other from getting on the telescope. A few years ago, um, I found an article in the Times which had a list of, um, you know, the pro various professions and the stress levels of the professions. And at the top were things like surgeon, you know, stockbroker, politician. And then way down the list was astronomer. In fact, it was under vicar, you know, and I thought this is just not right because uh, astronomers are just as cutthroat and competitive uh, as politicians. So these two guys fought it out, uh, trying to get observing time on this mighty telescope, which for 40 years was the most powerful telescope in the world. And then along came a woman, Beatrice Tinsley, a New Zealander, who persuaded them that the project they were doing was futile. They were trying to measure the rate at which the universe is slowing down. And what they were doing was they were assuming that galaxies were standard objects. And if you measured their redshift and their brightness, then you would be able to compare the motion of the galaxy due to the expansion of the universe with the distance and hence the look back time. And so they basically were trying to measure how the rate of the universe was slowing down. And uh, Beatrice pointed out to them that galaxies change their brightness with time, and so they evolve. And this was a huge paradigm shift in the subject when I was a postdoctoral researcher at Durham University in the late uh, 1970s. So we now have developed technologies to explore the earlier universe. So when I first started as an astronomer, believe it or not, we were using glass photographic plates. So these are you remember the old pictures of the photographer with a, with a tripod and he would have a, put a glass photographic plate in and he would slide the shutter out. And in the 1960s and 70s, uh, that's how uh, faint object astronomy was done. And then along came the charge couple device, the CCD, the digital detector that's in your, many of your phones. And that instantly was 30 times more sensitive so it's like having a telescope 30 times bigger than the one you've been using with photographic plates. And now these CCDs can be mosaiced and make you know, megapixel cameras, hundreds of megapixels, so we could take a panoramic picture of the sky, uh, such as this beautiful photograph of the Andromeda spiral. So that's the first revolution that I was very fortunate to uh, witness during my career. The, trans the transfer from photogra photography to digital highly efficient detectors. The second big thing was bigger telescopes. I told you the size of the telescope mirror is the most powerful indicator of the performance of the telescope. It's the light gathering power. So the Palomar telescope, the so-called 200 inch, has a mirror that's five meters across and these mirrors such as the twin Keck telescopes, have mirrors that are 10 meters across, or in the Gemini Observatory has single mirror that are eight meters across. Now, what's the limiting factor in making a mirror, a bigger and bigger mirror, and that is about eight meters, it turns out, is about the largest size for what we call a monolithic piece of glass that can be supported. 
and transported. Imagine taking something like that up a mountain road. So uh, the breakthrough, uh, largely uh, first at the Keck Observatory, was to make a mirror from hexagonal segments, 36 segments, each about a meter across. If you look very closely, especially on this slide, you may see the individual segments if you've got sharp eyes. And of course, the technology then, all of these segments have to be supported to make a parabolic or hyperbolic surface with high accuracy. And many uh, telescope manufacturers thought this was never going to be possible. But uh, a man called Jerry Nelson pioneered this technique uh, on the Keck telescopes. And then my final technological advance is robotics. Now, you see those two uh, sparring astronomers, Sandage and Jim Gunn, were measuring galaxies one by one. And, uh, you know, sometimes with photography, they were taking two night exposures. They would start the exposure on a Monday night, and then at the end of the night, they'd put the shutter back in, and then they'd come back on Tuesday night, they open the shutter and carry on. Uh, and so, you know, it was really hard work. And in, the number of galaxies that they could do was very limited because they were doing them one at a time. But in the field of view of the telescope, there are many galaxies. And so if you can use optical fibers, like it's a sort of plumbing, really, then the light from all of these individual galaxies can be collected and fed into an instrument that measures them all at the same time. And so we championed this originally in Australia. Um, uh, this is a sort of manual version where we're plugging the fibers into a, a brass plate with the holes in this brass plate are drilled at the positions of all the galaxies in the field of view. So I don't know if you can see, but I've got a pen and pencil here and every fiber has a number and every hole has a number, and I'm writing down which fiber number goes in which hole. And heaven forbid if you lose that piece of paper, because then you won't know what object is which, okay? Uh, and eventually we decided to automate this process. Um, and uh, this instrument has the very inspirational name of Autofib. Um, and rather as a publicity stunt, we use this robot. It comes along and it picks up each fiber and moves it to a particular spot here. The light comes from down from above here and enters a, a right angle prism that reflects the light down the fiber like so. And as a publicity stunt, we, we use this robot to make a map of Australia to which the frequent comment was, what about Tasmania? Um, <laughs> finally, uh, we managed to do the, this 400, 400 object uh, robot, which was very, very successful. So those three technologies transformed our ability to survey the distant universe. Better detectors, bigger mirrors, and what we call multi-object spectroscopy, doing, gathering the light from many objects simultaneously to make statistical progress. So how do we, get, how do we, how do we choose which galaxies we want to observe? How do we get a head start on which are the most distant? I've told you that a faint galaxy needn't necessarily be distant. It could be a remarkably feeble object nearby, or it could be a luminous object at great distance. But there's one very nice trick, and that is the universe is full of hydrogen, hydrogen gas. There's hydrogen gas in between the stars. There's even hydrogen gas in between the galaxies. It's very tenuous, but it's there. And hydrogen has a very important feature. It absorbs light in the ultraviolet. And so if you take a picture in red light, in green light, and a certain kind of ultraviolet light, then the galaxy that's the most distant disappears, and uh, whereas all the other galaxies are still there. So this is a telltale indication that this particular galaxy is far more distant because it's behind a screen of hydrogen that's cut it off in the ultraviolet. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope has many color filters. There are blue ones, green ones, yellow ones, red ones, and infrared ones. And as the galaxy in this simulation, as the galaxy moves to higher redshift and hence more distant objects, you can see 
it disappears successively in each filter. So if you, all you have to do then is to take color pictures with Hubble and determine in which color filter the galaxy disappears. And that gives you an approximate redshift and hence an approximate look back time to that object. Now, just to, as an interlude, uh, what's it like to go to a big telescope and observe? How does it, how does it work? And uh, the answer is we write proposals and time, if the proposal is successful, time is scheduled in six-month blocks. And every astronomer is allocated either one or two or three nights on a particular calendar date. And if you go to the telescope, uh, basically, you know, you're scheduled on those particular dates. You have to get there um, unless you're going to observe remotely. And... Uh, you know, it's very exciting. I'm still a romantic at heart. I stand on a mountain top and I watch the sunset, you know, far from home and I look at the night sky and then I go into the dome and I think, what discoveries might I make tonight? And let me tell you, making a discovery in real time is inspirational, particularly for young students. So here's a student, former student of mine, operating the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and here's another one. And if they make a discovery, it's inspirational. You know, it's uh, telephone calls home, champagne at dawn, maybe if it's important, you know, some surprise, a new result that changes the subject. Now, that happens very rarely. Um, unfortunately, the downside is cloudy weather. You go all the way to Hawaii or Chile, and you remember, you've been allocated only those nights. There's no rain check if it's cloudy. You know, there's somebody breathing down your neck, coming on tomorrow, who's got another project. And the most annoying thing is it's cloudy for your run, and then miraculously, when the next guy comes, it's clear. You know, you have to say, oh, very nice, you're lucky, you know, <laughs> and then fly all the way home. So this is a cloudy night photo, <laughs> all right? This guy here, these are all former students, and they're, they've all done very well. Uh, this guy here has finished his thesis, he's, he's cheerful. But he, you know, he feels sorry for the cloudy weather. This guy here is Italian. I don't know, they're always happy. <laughs> um, this guy here with his head on a side, his thesis is rapidly going down the drain because it's, you know, the fourth cloudy night in a row. And so he's wondering what he's going to do uh, for the rest of his life. This um, is where the professor has to, you know, my role is then the cheerleader. I have to buy the pizza and the bottles of wine and that's why I think this is slightly blurred, probably. <laughs> okay, so how far, I'm, I'm heading in the right direction. I'm nearly at James Webb. So how far back did we look with Hubble? Well, we used two techniques. This one is to point Hubble in a non-interesting area of sky for two weeks. And I remember somebody, one of my colleagues, um, a professor who's, who's very critical, actually, and he said, you know, Richard, that is the most stupid thing. Just, you know, it needs no intellect at all. All you do is steer this telescope, open the shutter for two weeks. You know, it's not imaginative. But that's what we did. And there are 3,000 galaxies in this field. Uh, it's a size across here is about a tenth of the diameter of the full moon. And it's called the ultra deep field. It's the deepest picture we ever took with Hubble. And it was taken in 2012. Now there was, you know, okay, there was the deep field, then there was the very deep field, you know, and this is the ultra deep field. And so I'm privileged that I had the final word in the deep fields with Hubble. Now, these objects marked with uh, colored squares and numbers are the most distant objects in this image. And we located them with those color, remember those filters that slid back and the object disappeared? That's how we knew that they were the most distant. And we thought this object was by far and away the most distant. It, it, we thought it had a redshift of 11.9, which would mean it was being seen when the universe was about 4% of its present age. But we, you know, we weren't completely certain. And this was a collaboration with colleagues at the, at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. If any of you have been to Blackford Hill, it's a beautiful spot. 
Um, and that was what we did. That's the first way of looking uh, at great distances. The second method is this gravitational lensing. So let, let's go into gravitational lensing in a little bit more detail. Has anybody ever heard of gravitational lensing? Mm, very good, excellent, okay. So Einstein um, basically postulated that light could be deflected by massive objects. Space can be shaped. When you have a massive object, it distorts space around it. That's the origin of gravity. Newton was very worried. How does the Earth know the sun is there? How does it know to go in a circle? The answer is the sun distorts space and the Earth is going around in curved space around the sun. And there was a test of this. A light ray, you can see the deflection here of space, a light ray would be deflected by the sun. Now you can't measure a star normally because so, the sun is too bright, but at the time of an eclipse, you could measure the positions of the stars and you could see if they were in the same place or not as when the sun isn't in the way. And they should be deflected, according to Einstein. And this inspired this guy, Sir Arthur Eddington at Cambridge, brilliant theorist, but he decided wisely to become an observer uh, for this particular experiment. He went to Principe, an island off the west coast of Africa, took these photographs and proved that the stars were not in the same place as when the sun <laughs> isn't there. And um, uh, you would have thought he would be famous, but it really catapulted Einstein into, famous, into fame. My wife gave me an Einstein calendar a few years ago. You know, every month had a picture of Einstein doing something different. There was Einstein on a bicycle, Einstein against the blackboard, you know, uh, Einstein pulling a face. And then I realized by the time we got to April, he only had one suit. It was always the same suit. <laughs> Eddington um, was contacted by the Daily Telegraph when this fantastic verification of the bending of light came out. And a journalist asked him, said, Professor Eddington, it's, it's, it's suggested there are only t three people in the world who understand Einstein's theory, to which apparently Eddington said, who's that third person? Uh, so he was a bit of a puckish guy. Okay, so back to uh, Joe Biden again. Here's the cluster of galaxies. Now we see the deflection can be used as a powerful magnifying glass uh, to get a sort of free additional boosting power uh, for the Hubble Space Telescope or any ground-based telescope. And uh, here's a simulation of a transparent lens moving across the, the field of the sky. It's a simulation, obviously, but you can see that the magnifications can be enormous if the alignment between the background object and the lens and the observer is very accurate. Even far away uh, from the center of the lens, you can see the images are stretched and hence magnified. So this technique has been used by Hubble as well. Here's uh, an example. Here's a cluster of galaxies. You see, we can get multiple images. You can see A, B, and C are three images of the same object. And uh, you can see it, the, the images of A here, A and B, are stretched. And so the light is magnified uh, by this foreground cluster. So those two techniques used by Hubble, you know, the mundane project to point in a boring area of sky and expose for two weeks and uh, to look through a series of lensing clusters. And this is where we got to with Hubble. It's the census of how many galaxies there are per unit volume as we go back in time. So if you like, just focus on the top axis. This is the age of the universe in billions of years. So here's a billion years, here's half a billion years. And remember, we're way over here, 13.8 billion years. It's a logarithmic scale, so from minus one to minus four is a factor of a thousand. So clearly we're running out of galaxies. There are far fewer galaxies out here than there are here. So we're seeing the birth of galaxies and a continuous assembly, more and more galaxies forming all the time. 
And if we extrapolate this to zero, you would think that where that's, you know, that's where it all started. Unfortunately, you know, with Hubble, there, was a, there were two teams and they didn't agree. Uh, this team felt that the numbers were falling very sharply. This team felt that they were declining more gradually. And you can see it makes a big difference as to when cosmic dawn would have occurred. Already, this is out of date, uh, in six months uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope. There's one other technique that you can use to try to pinpoint when all this happened, when all this starlight first uh, occurred, and that is to go to a very distant object. So again, this is age of the universe. Say, find some of the most distant objects out here, like this one, and try to estimate how old they are. And the analogy here is, you know, you walk down the street, you see a four-year-old boy. You weren't there when he was born, but if you can figure out uh, how, old he are, what, how old he is, then of course you can say exactly uh, when he was born. Likewise, if we can go, if we can find a technique uh, for determining how long this galaxy has been forming stars, how old are the stars, then even though we can't use Hubble to look further out here, it just doesn't have the capability, then we can pinpoint when cosmic dawn occurred. So here at UCL, that's what we, we did if just before James Webb was launched. We went this time to Chile, to the Atacama Desert. No trees, very, very dry. In some places, it's never rained in recorded history. Can you imagine? Here's the galaxy, this very distant object. And here we are using the very large telescope to measure the age of this galaxy. Um, Europeans love their comfort. This is the only observatory with a swimming pool. Um, no, no expense spared, of course. And so we applied this technique to six galaxies, and we estimated their ages, and we predicted when cosmic dawn occurred, somewhere between 250 and 400 million years after the Big Bang. And crucially, we calculated that the, the soon-to-be-launched James Webb Space Telescope had the capability to look that f f bit further back in time and detect these objects uh, in their earlier state. So, James Webb. I was very lucky, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, I was at a conference in California and I was able to visit the James Webb Space Telescope in, in its clean room in El Segundo, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, here's a human. And uh, as you can see, it's a segmented mirror telescope. It's got 16 segments. Uh, and uh, the aperture from here to here is six and a half meters. You can see it, the mirrors can be folded uh, so that it can fit in the nose cone of a rocket. The mirror is too big to be launched in its open format. It has to be folded. So that's one risk. You know, when it's in space, it has to open up again. Um, these mirrors are gold coated. They're actually, they're made of beryllium. Beryllium is the lightest metal. Uh, they are gold coated because gold uh, is a per almost perfect reflector in the infrared. In the optical, it's too expensive, so we use aluminium. But in the infrared, aluminium, uh, its uh, reflectivity falls off. And so to ensure the best possible performance, uh, no expense spared, uh, the mirrors are gold coated. Now, my history with this project goes back to 1996, when um, NASA uh, set up a committee called, as you can see, HST, Hubble Space Telescope and Beyond. And I was the only um, European uh, on this committee. I was at Cambridge University at the time. And um, we proposed in this report in 1996, the next generation space telescope. Um, and uh, so that's 25 years from that report to the launch on Christmas Day, 2021. And that's, you know, that's what it's like in space astronomy, I'm afraid. 
It's a very expensive uh, mission, $10 billion. We can discuss that if you're interested. So here's a, uh, a, a very painful moment where the $10 billion facility is hanging by a hook. Um, you know, <laughs> I hope they took some tablets. And uh, it's being transported to the nose cone of this Ariane rocket in uh, Guyana in South America. I didn't, one of my former students uh, and a former postdoc of mine flew to Guyana and watched the launch, but uh, you know, I, I decided to watch it on TV um, in, uh, in Christmas Day. And here's the launch on Christmas Day. So it, you can see uh, in this schematic here, it's in the nose cone of this rocket, the Ariane rocket. Here's the launch. Here's the last view of James Webb over the Horn of Africa on its way to 1.5 kil million kilometers. Now, Hubble orbits the Earth. And of course, you remember that it could be correct, it could be uh, maintained and upgraded using the space shuttle. No such luck with James Webb. Because it's an infrared telescope, it has to be cool. It has to be out in deep space, beyond the moon. It's at a very special place called the Lagrangian point. This is the Earth. This is the sun. This, the significance of this point here is that the gravitational pull that James Webb gets from the Earth plus the sun is the same gravitational pull that the Earth gets from the sun alone. And what that means is that the Earth and the James Webb orbit the sun at the same angular speed. So they're always in sync. And that's, of course, very important for communications. It would be really hopeless if James Webb was the other side of the sun. So what have we found? So in the space of, uh, must be now six months or more, seven months probably, uh, there are 75 papers on the internet uh, about distant galaxies with the James Webb Space Telescope. I've selected one figure here from the group at Edinburgh uh, this is the same figure that I showed you before, the number of galaxies per unit volume. And you remember there was controversy whether the numbers were falling steeply or uh, going continuously. This is how far we could look with Hubble. And you can see we can now extend this diagram out to a redshift of 16. There's some controversy about this last point. Uh, and the implication is that Cosmic Dawn, the so-called Holy Grail, which is this little symbol here, uh, is within sight. Now, um, these, uh, let me just pause at this point, go back to this point. Remember, these uh, redshifts are determined with that color technique, uh, where the filter, you remember that slide where the images drop out and so forth. Um, it is an approximate method, and it has been known to be wrong. Um, and so getting the spectrum of the galaxy in order to measure the redshift accurately is the next step. And the first results are very promising, and I've, I've decided to show the object that we found with Hubble that we thought was at 11.9, but we weren't sure. And Emma Curtis Lake, who's an astronomer at the University of Hertfordshire, uh, managed to get this spectrum. Uh, and here's that hydrogen absorption. There's no question. Uh, it's at a redshift of 11.6. So we're very pleased about that. And here's another spectrum so <coughs> where we can see the fingerprints of nitrogen, helium, carbon, magnesium, oxygen, neon, uh, and a galaxy at a redshift of of 10.6 or so. So this is the beginning of chemistry, which we couldn't do with Hubble at all. So, you know, the logical step now uh, to go back to this decline is we would expect the chemical composition of these objects to be going down because the stars have had less time to synthesize the heavy elements that we see today. And so, you know, the logical thing would be to find an object that's chemically pristine. And that would be the first telltale indication that we finally reached uh, the beginning of the story. So um, I'm more or less done. Um, you know, this 
key signature is, uh, is going to be uh, the telltale signature that we don't see the heavy elements that we see around us today in these early galaxies. That would be an indication that we finally reached the beginning. We're witnessing an early object emerging from darkness. It's not going to be easy. Uh, these spectra are very challenging to get. Uh, the period in time where a galaxy is unpolluted is very, very short. So these objects may be very rare. We may have to do a statistical experiment to get the final answer. But we have 15 years, we hope, of successful observations ahead of us. And when I look back over my career and all the facilities I've used, all the telescopes I've used have done far more than they originally predicted they would. Astronomers, unlike politicians, deliver far more uh, than, than they predicted. So on that cheerful note, thank you very much. Thank you.